Okay. Brina, so you have a story about your grandfather, and um, we'd like to hear about it. Can you tell us more about your book? Sure. Uh, My grandfather was sentenced to death three times in the early 1900s in Russia and lived to tell about it. And that's what my book is about. It's based on the diaries that he began keeping in 1905 during the Russo-Japanese War. Wow. (laughs) What did he do to get sentenced to death three times? Well, the the fundamental problem was that he was Jewish at a time when anti-Semitism was the official government policy in Russian-occupied territories. He happened to have been born in Poland. But he also had a tendency to stand up for what he believed in, and that also wasn't a desirable attribute at the time. So the first time he was sentenced to death, it was because his uh, commanding officer on virtually his first day in the Russian army referred to him with a very common term of endearment, a Jewish slur, which everybody used very openly and casually at the time. But for some reason, on that occasion, my grandfather took offense and overreacted. And in fact, he hit his commanding officer over the head with what he was with what he was holding in his hand at the time, which happened to be an iron tea kettle filled with steaming water. So you can imagine that was a death sentence worthy offense. Yes. The uh, the third time his death sentence was for being part of a revolutionary underground movement to overthrow the Tsar, which is something that he swore he would do during the Russo-Japanese War as he was seeing so many thousands of young men thrown away, really just thrown into a, a, a war that was already lost virtually from the beginning. And he wanted to see to it that the Tsar could never do that again. Right. Okay. And um, what you say that you had the diaries in your family for 60 years. What inspired you to yes. write to, um, to write the book now yeah. after all this time? Well, originally, uh, after my grandfather escaped from his third death sentence and from Siberia and he fled to the U.S., He told the stories of his experiences with his very unique sense of humor to people to entertain them. And they constantly said, you have to write these stories down and you have to publish them. He wanted to, although he didn't have time, at least not until the Depression. And once he sat down to start writing, he didn't stop for the next 20 years. And then one day in 1950, he felt he was done. By then, he'd filled 28 composition notebooks. You know, those black and white marble notebooks that we can still find. (laughs) 28 notebooks with stories about growing up Jewish in Russian-occupied territories at this time and being part of this disastrous Russian army in their losing uh, Russo-Japanese war. And on the very day he finished, he asked my mother, who was his youngest child, if she would help him translate the diaries because he wrote entirely in Yiddish. And she was delighted. She'd grown up hearing his stories. He he read his stories from his notebooks to his kids every Sunday. So she said, that's great, Papa. We'll start tomorrow. And then at about 1 o'clock in the morning, he woke her and said, don't wake mama, but I feel pressure around my chest. And he died that very night while my mother was constantly calling the hospital to get them to send an ambulance. So oh. there was, that was in 1950. Nothing more was thought about the diaries until about 1953 or so when my mother was dating my father who happened to be the first Orthodox writer in Hollywood. He had grown up in Germany and was fluent in Yiddish, too, and was absolutely enthralled by the diaries, just as my mother had been, because of this incredible sense of humor in spite of horrible circumstances. So after they married, they translated the diaries, which took between years and more likely decades because of the complexity 
but they published a portion of my grandfather's diaries in 1976. And my father had always intended to complete the publishing of the diaries, but he too passed away before he was done. And then a few years ago, my mother, who was then in her early 80s, said that she hoped she would see her father's story told during her lifetime. And that was when I said, all right, I will put aside other things and I will publish these diaries. So it's, it was, it's been a very long passage with several attempts to share these stories that we now can finally enjoy and learn from. Wonderful. And what do you think the general public can learn from those diaries? Well, there are a number of things. There's some interesting historic lessons about how history repeats itself, that when uh, a population has had the same leader, whether it's an individual, a family, a ruling party, or a religious party, for decades to centuries, when there's suppression of political dissent and very high levels of unemployment, which is what we saw in various Arab countries last year during the Arab Spring, it's a formula for revolution because life becomes cheap and people are willing to give their lives to change society. Another lesson which I take from my grandfather's uniquely positive view on his circumstances is that it isn't the circumstances that dictate how your life will turn out, but rather how you respond to them. And by maintaining his optimism, he also maintained his creativity and his ability to think of very unusual ways to escape a variety of circumstances and to survive against the odds. But the the other overwhelming lesson, and again, this is not something that my grandfather planted in there as lessons because, after all, he died after just finishing the first draft, but it grows out of his character. Uh, it comes from the, the three parting words from his father as he left, as my grandfather left for war. He said, be a Jew, which means not just literally maintain your identity, which my grandfather did, but it means be a good human being and treat other people honorably, despite how they treat you. And that was the way my grandfather interacted, even with people who had openly expressed that they wanted to kill him. He would still treat them humanely and appropriately, and often their behavior changed, but he was doing it because that was how he felt it was appropriate to treat a fellow human being. And I think it's that's a wonderful lesson to remember. Yeah. Tell us about some of the unusual escapes you mentioned. Let's see. Uh, there was once when he was part of the Revolutionary Underground where they wanted him to deliver ammunition and they dressed him up in, in women's clothing so he could move, uh, you know, undetected through the streets of, uh, I guess that was Warsaw at the time. Uh, and, and that's actually not the best way to not be detected is <laughs> to go in disguise. Um, he managed to find people who would help him in the most unlikely of places. But it was because he took some chances and he was completely open about who he was. There were people who did not want to help escape convicts or revolutionaries, but he was honest about who he was, and they trusted him and helped him. Huh. What kind he of also, people? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, just wondering what you've heard so far about the book. What have people said? Well, a couple of things. One common comment is, wow, when I think... I have trouble, I see what he lived through and how he viewed his conditions with optimism and I realize, you know, I don't have it that bad. And then the next comment is, when's the movie coming out? <laughs> and when is the movie coming out? Don't know yet, still uh, open to opportunities, but there uh -huh. are a couple of directors reading the book now. Oh, there are. Yeah, so that's in the works. Of so we'll see. Not, it's not quite in the works, but um, 
it's it's a first step. I think more people need to know about the book before that will happen, but that's fine. The story is kind of timeless. Well, this is, and can you tell us where we could get the book? Yes, it's available on my website, theaccidentalanarchist.com, where it's available in paperback as well as in ebook format. It's also available on Amazon and uh, bnbarnesandnoble.com, Smashwords, uh, various other outlets. Last week, I discovered that it was being sold in India, which I didn't know anything about, uh, and you know, a few other surprising places. Great. <laughs> but those those are the reliable ones. Okay. And I hope that you will be uh, in the chat room when we air this interview because I'm sure that viewers might have questions. Oh, I would love that. Uh, yeah, just let me know when it is and I will make plans to be available and, and connect with people. Okay, looking forward to that. Thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you for uh, for inviting me. I'm delighted to talk about the book with you. Bye-bye.